Good morning, everyone. My name is Carrie Ramsey, and I am the project manager for the Weekend Project at Queen's University, which is funded by FedDev Ontario through the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy. And I am so grateful that you are here today. We are in for a treat. So excited to hear from Carla Briones today from Immigrant to Entrepreneur. And if you see my eyes just darting to the left a little bit, that's just because I'm letting folks in from the waiting room. <laughs> we have, we have a, a large group that is joining us today, but we're so grateful that you've made the time in your schedule. Um, and we would love to find out a little bit more about you and where you are connecting from. So why don't you drop a note into the chat today? Let us know what corner of the world uh, or the country you're connecting from, first of all. Also, if you have a business, let us know the name of your business. You can add in the, the link to your business if you'd like. This is also about networking as well as, as learning. So uh, we would love to know where you're connecting from today. Uh, just a note to let you know today's session is being recorded. So if you would like a copy, I will be dropping my email into the chat so that you can reach out to me and I will be sure to direct you to our YouTube channel where you can find all of the workshops uh, that have happened in the past, including this one. So while you're taking a moment to let us know where you're connecting from in the chat, uh, I will take a moment to acknowledge that I'm connecting from Belleville, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the First Nations people and specifically the Huron, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. This is the traditional hunting, fishing and gathering territory and today we're talking about immigration. And even though my children are fifth generation Canadians, we are all still immigrants to this amazing nation. And we want to acknowledge the First Nations people who were the first ones here. And uh, what a beautiful, beautiful country to live in. And so if you're connecting from other areas of the world, we'd love to hear that as well. Welcome to everyone today. I am so looking forward to this. I probably told Carla this, you know, six or seven times in the last 24 hours. I can't wait, I'm looking forward to this. I love to hear stories of women and the journeys that they've been on. And today in particular, I know many of you who have signed up for this workshop are immigrants yourselves, new immigrants to Canada, uh, newcomers to uh, Turtle Island, if you will, the North American continent. So welcome to you. Carla, I don't wanna take any more of your time. Uh, let's just jump right into this. So uh, please do join me in welcoming Carla Brion. Thank you, Carrie. I'm super excited to be here. So I see some people in the chat here from Ottawa. I see someone from Morocco. That's amazing. Um, some are Ottawa people. I love it. Uh, originally from Peru. Yay. Hello, everybody. So anyways, I'm super excited to be here. If at any chance, uh, at any time in the in the in the chat, you are um, curious about anything, you have any questions, feel free to drop it off. I'll be checking the chat, uh, the chat room just to see if there's any questions that arise so that I can answer them on the go. If not, then we'll have a little Q&A session towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but feel free to ask as you uh, as the questions arise. So my name is Carla Briones and I am a proud immigrant. I am originally from Mexico. And uh, let's get this uh, let's get this uh, this chat started. So I'm just gonna here we go. So this is um, a saying that I really love. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. And the reason why I love this uh, saying so much is because it's something that I try or that I aspire to be because I've had really good examples from uh, how I grew up, from my parents, from the community that has embraced me here in Canada. And it's something that I am trying to live by these words. I grew up in the north of Mexico, so Chihuahua, where the little dog comes from, yes. Um, and it's uh, bordering with Texas, with the United States. My dad and my mom had a veterinary clinic. I mean, those, I don't know how old that picture is, but it's like pretty funky. They look, they look pretty 70s, 80s, I love it. Um, but they were always the team. So I always remember my dad being in the surgery room and he had his own clinic and he just had a huge love for animals that actually um, grew into me as well. I remember going to, so that's myself, growing with my dad to different farms and different agricultural places to, my dad would go to take care of cattle while I would just hang out and, and just see what my dad was doing and how he would, uh, how he would do business. 
this is a picture um, of my mom, my two brothers and myself. And I was six years old there. So again, ever since I was little, I, I saw my parents always work really hard. And even though they had their own business and, and, and you know, they, they, they work super hard, we weren't rich by any means in Mexico. Like in many parts, probably in Latin America, you work really hard, uh, but there's always a ceiling that you hit. And unless you know someone, in, someone um, that's, that's about, you know, that's about where you get. So, uh, and in also in Latin America, at least in Mexico and in my family, grades were super important. Um, it, you know, like doing good in school and respecting your teachers was super important. So uh, my dad and my mom gave us a challenge uh, when I was six years old, that if we got straight A's for an entire year, year that they would uh, drive us to Disneyland My, and, and remember I lived in the north of Mexico so the drive was about 10 hours so it wasn't like it was like it wasn't that close but it was doable and then what they said was okay so we have enough to drive to Disneyland stay overnight get into the theme park but we don't have enough money to um to get you some you know chocolates or whatever souvenirs so you're gonna have to work for that and um, so I was six years old and I didn't know what to do, but I remember my parents always being on the go. So I asked my parents for a loan of, uh, I think the equivalent of $20, $20 or whatever. And I decided to buy candy. And then I resold that candy in my school backyard and I started getting a lot of success. And then I started hiring other kids and then they, I was paying them commission. So we took over the entire backyard of our school. And then my parents get the dreaded call from the school principal and my parents were like, what's going on? And I, yeah, it's, it's in regards to Carla. And I'm like, oh my God, Carla. So they go into the school. They're like probably thinking that I'm, I don't know, failed everything. And turns out the cafeteria was complaining or the cafeteria lady, lady was complaining because I was taking way too much business away from her. And they demanded that I shut down my operations of my candy empire. So unfortunately I had to shut down, but that was my first experience in, on, uh, in entrepreneurship. And, you know, first it was candy, then it went into like making t-shirts, like, like, you know, coloring t-shirts and selling them and then hair bows. And then my grandmother used to have her own importing business. So I used to go to different bazaars and help her sell. So I had a lot of very good influences around me about, about business and entrepreneurship and just making it happen. So little six year old me got to see Mickey got to buy her candy and then eventually it's I think it, this was the, the base of my entrepreneurship uh, love affair. Unfortunately um, in the north of Mexico in the late 90s so I was uh, 18 years old um, there were uh, that's when the drug cartels and the drug wars and the lords and everything that you see on Netflix movies right now well, I lived that. I lived that as a as a bystander, as someone who just happened to be living in that part of the of the country, and unfortunately, it became a very unsafe environment to run businesses, to basically have freedom to just walk around the streets without fearing that, you know, something bad was going to happen. And uh, that's when my parents decided to basically do the ultimate sacrifice and really show that they were leading or they were leaders in their own little you know immediate family because for them success was about growing us growing my brothers and i so they uprooted themselves and we all did completely and uh, decided to come to canada to a land that we've never been to um, we had absolutely no idea what was what was waiting here. And uh, yeah, so then uh, in the way that we uh, that we came to Canada was actually in a U-Haul truck. So that's the U-Haul truck um, that I spent about six days of my life in 97 with a cat on my lap, a dog in the back. We had to make like several pit stops just to let the poor dog out to, you know, take a break. There was no radio, no air conditioner in that U-Haul because it was the cheapest one that we could get. Um, but that truck basically held our entire lives. And we drove that truck nonstop, well, not nonstop, but like we drove it through uh, the 
the United States until we reached Canada, uh, the, the border of Prescott, I still remember, on July 14, 1997. And it was, if you've been to Ottawa, and actually I think Kingston may still have this. And for those that are still waiting to come to Canada that you're waiting on your PRs, just be, 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 beware summers the Ottawa summers or this part of this region in Canada summers are so hot like sometimes you get like this humidity like humidix was a new word for me so I remember July 14 1997 was probably the hottest um day that I remember in my life where you almost like breathe water with the humidity and mind you I'm from the north of Mexico so that is the desert so I'm used to I can handle heat no problem, but it's dry heat. So coming here to experience the, the, the wettest summer ever, it was quite the experience. And, uh, but anyway, so it was, it was, um, it was an exciting time for myself. I mean, I'm an 18 year old who just finished high school. All of my friends were going away to do university somewhere else. And unfortunately my parents couldn't afford to send me anywhere. So I knew that had I stayed in Mexico, my chances of getting a better education and my chances of getting ahead in life, it's not that they wouldn't have been nil, but they, I would have probably had to struggle a lot more. So obviously coming to this new country was exciting, but unfortunately back then, so this is late 90s, early 2000s, um, there wasn't that much help available for immigrants. We literally crossed the border, they stamped our passports with our visa, and they just said, welcome to Canada. And they gave us a pamphlet, I remember, where they told us where to get our social insurance number and where to get our health card. And that was it. So we had no friends, no family. And again, it was the biggest adventure of our lives. And unfortunately, we ended up living your typical immigrant experience. Um, my parents, my mom was a, um, uh, the dean of, um, of a school back in Mexico, but over here, obviously, and I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this term, she did not have Canadian experience. And um, so, so her credentials as an educator were not valid here. Same with my dad as a veterinarian doctor, his credentials were not valid. And we came to Canada assuming that it would be a super easy uh, endeavor finding job for uh, finding a job for my dad, but unfortunately that was not the case. And uh, so the first few years were kind of hard. Actually, they were very hard. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Um, thankfully, there's a lot more help now, but back then there wasn't. So, um, and I always, I joke now, so you can laugh about it. Um, it's okay. But I always joke that my dad didn't end up driving a taxi because the gas company called first. Um, so his first job was selling gas contracts from door to door. Um, then he moved up and then was selling insurance. My mom ended up cleaning homes. Um, she then eventually got a job at a at a grocery store that she ended up working for a long time there and she actually really enjoyed it. Um, and then in the meantime, myself, I was going to university and I saw how much my parents were struggling. So uh, there was a time in my university career, I studied journalism, that I actually was working, I was going to school full time and then working three jobs just to help with my parents or help my parents um, and help put food on the table and pay rent for a little townhouse that we had rented. And I mean, life, life was Life wasn't easy. It definitely tested my parents. It tested myself. It tested us as a family. But I'm so grateful that at least we had each other because that's what eventually made us um, made us succeed. Uh, so my dad, after and this is a story on its own, but after many many tries, after you know, many sacrifices, sleepless nights. Uh, again, this is a story on its own, but I'm just going to shorten it. Uh, he ended up qualifying or recertifying as a veterinarian doctor. And his dream was always to have his own practice here in Canada, but he didn't know how to do it, right? Because you're new, you don't know how to how to do business here in Canada. And eventually he figured it away and he opened the Montreal Road Animal Hospital. Um, and it was a family affair. It was, he was the, the, it was a one doctor shop. My mom, who's the, the lady in orange, 
Um, again, she worked in a grocery store, but then eventually said, okay, no, I need to do something with my life and ended up going back to school and certified as a laboratory technician. And there were points where I was going to university and my mom was also going through her studies and we were study partners. It was so cool. And so it was very inspiring to see how my parents in their late 40s, early 50s, when a lot of people are already starting to think about what they're going to do in their retirement. They were starting all over again. So, as a you know, as a young adult myself, I I I was just amazed at, the, at their determination, and it was hard not to get excited about their plans and their accomplishments. So I remember going to the when 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 my dad first got the the location, like tearing down walls. The, the entire family and friends were like laying down the floors, and we were painting. So we did it all as a family and it was an exciting time. And I always say that entrepreneurship is contagious. Talk to an entrepreneur and it almost gives you this like, ooh, I want to do that too. Or I want to do something like that too, because we're um, entrepreneurs are always very positive and they're very, um, you know, they have this can do personality. And certainly that was the, that was the case with both my parents. So at the moment or at the time when my parents opened the clinic, I had already graduated from journalism and I was working in public relations in Toronto. And I was like, you know, like I, I thought that I made it big. And I really loved my job, but again, entrepreneurship is contagious. And then um, I remember one day talking to my parents on the phone and I was, I was on my, in my office in Toronto and I was in a fast track career in my, you know, mid, late 20, mid, mid twenties. And uh, you know, when you work in an office and, and it's the middle of the summer, but you're wearing a wool sweater because the air conditioner is so cold. Okay, it was that day. So imagine myself, you know, wearing a wool sweater and then summer is beautiful outside. And there's these ladies going by with cute little, you know, summer dresses. And I had gotten my first dog as an adult. So the dog, the dog of my life, I call him. And, um, and I'm talking to my parents and they're telling me about, you know, all of their, their, their successes and their hardships. Cause also, you know, being an entrepreneur, there's uh, highs and lows. And then I found myself telling them, you know what guys, all I ever wanted to do. And I kind of brace myself is open up a pet store. And then there was silence in the line and I'm like, oh man. And almost in unison, this is when my parents replied to me, so why don't you? And I think that was the turning moment for, for myself. It was the turning moment and perhaps I was just waiting for their approval. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 41 now and, and I just wanted, I've always wanted to make my parents proud. And I thought that by me following this journalism career and public relations and whatnot, that's, you know, that's how I was making my parents proud, but I wasn't happy. And I had found my joy in the animal industry, funny enough, with coming from the animal, you know, from an animal loving family. And, uh, and, and they basically said, so why don't you? So it almost gave me permission to kind of go for it full tilt. And I was pregnant at the moment or at that time. So I was about four months pregnant. So Basically, I used it with my husband. We used my maternity leave to um, move back to Ottawa, where our family was, and build up a business plan, build up a case, build up you know our our financials and whatnot, so that we could open up our first uh, our first shop in the middle of the 2008 recession. So it was not easy. There were a lot of bumps along the way. But, um, you know, after a lot of work, a lot of sleepless nights, um, you know, I ended up opening Global Pet Foods in Canada. If you're familiar with Ottawa, it's in, it's in the suburbs. Um, and it was an exciting time. And then, you know, and again, my, my daughter was one that she had just turned one the moment we flicked up the, the open sign. And I had just dropped her off to her first experience in daycare. And it was the same day that I ended up, you know, having my first experience as, an, as, a, as a business owner. And it was super exciting. There was a lot of mistakes that I made, a lot of mistakes. 
and um, a lot of unknowns, but definitely a lot of excitement and a lot of encouragement from both sides, like from from um, from my husband, and then encouragement from from my parents who had gone through through the same um, experience of opening something new. Then a year later, you know, I uh, decided to oh sorry, I decided to um, open a second one. Uh, this is more like downtown-ish, not like like center town west of Ottawa, um, a smaller location. Um, and then right in between those, I had another kid. So life was really, really, really fast tracked. And uh, and uh, I'm not going to say that it was all, you know, lollipops and rainbows. There were a lot of really hard moments, a lot of nights where I didn't know if I was going to have enough money to pay my staff or to pay rent. But somehow, um, you know, hard work, determination, and a lot of creativity uh, always, always came to the rescue. And then about three years now, so you see, I that four years. Oh my God, it's gonna be four years. About four years ago, um, I decided to open up a restaurant, and it's a franchise, so it's freshy, so it's like a healthy fast food restaurant. And my famous last words is like, how hard can it be? And for anybody who has a restaurant or has any food based um, businesses, oh my God, like I regret those words because it is probably one of the toughest businesses to be in. Um, but I have learned so much. So all these three businesses are still open. I have about, you know, depending on the, on the season, about 60 staff altogether, give or take. Um, obviously COVID has been quite a, um, a challenging time for any small business owner. Um, but anyway, so, so here we are with three, three businesses and I'm trying to, um, you know, trying to compartmentalize my time, making sure that everybody is, or all businesses are being shown the, you know, the TLC and the love that they deserve. And about three years ago, um, my dad and my mom, because they became the team. So again, my mom was a laboratory technician and she became my dad's practice manager. And then my dad was the, was the veterinarian, obviously, along with, with his vet technician's teams. But um, about three years ago, so this is when my, my dad was already 60, 67. The guy's tired. I mean, he's, he started his life, you know, in, in when, when most people are starting to think about retirement. And he decided to, uh, to put his business up for sale. He wanted to retire. He's, he's had enough. He just, wants, um, he just wants to enjoy basically his retirement. And at the same time, uh, unfortunately, he got diagnosed with a rare um, neurological condition. So he had to go through brain surgery, almost like a, an emergency brain surgery. So um, this is... This is um, the reason I'm, I'm putting this in there, the reason I'm sharing this is because again, like the, those, those feet that you see over there, that's my mom, one of my brothers, I have another one, uh, and myself waiting in the, in the weight room as my dad is going through surgery. And as my dad is going through surgery, we had found, or he ended up hiring me actually, my dad to sell the business, to get, do, get all the paperwork ready and basically take care of the sale of the business. And in that moment, we had found also a buyer. So I'm doing all of the due diligence and trying to get all the paperwork together, sending to accountants and sending to lawyers. And that's when I realized that my dad had made a catastrophic mistake in the setup of his business 13 years prior. And that mistake ended up... Um, ended up, you know, us having to go through 13 years, backtrack 13 years worth of accounting, backtrack 13 years worth of, uh, you know, tax payments that were done improperly because he didn't know what he didn't know. And that initial mistake, it's something so simple that could have been avoided had he had someone who would have told him how to do things. And unfortunately that mistake cost him his retirement. Uh, I put his retirement in jeopardy and uh, now he's still, I mean, he's, he just turned 70, by the way, he's healthy, surgery went well, it's all good. Um, but unfortunately he's at the point where the retirement or the sale of the business is not enough to sustain both of them for the rest of their lives, however long or short they may be. So he still has to work. Um, and I remember 
telling him the news about the mistake that he had done and what that meant. So, um, and I remember his face and I remember his face and, and, and like this, like tears, like welling up in his eyes and saying, oh my God, like, it's just back then I didn't know what I didn't know. And I felt so powerless. And that's when I started asking myself, how many other immigrants go through this? How many other immigrants have gone through opening businesses thinking that they had a business back home and they know how to do things, but then realizing too late that it's not exactly how things are done here in Canada and potentially, you know, losing their life savings um, and losing their hard work. Uh, and, and that's when I realized that I needed to do something because, because why don't I, right? Because I have learned um, so much in my own business experience and I've made a lot of mistakes myself, but I fixed them and I've been able to acquire my own networks that what good are those networks and what good is that knowledge if I don't share it with the next generation of, of aspiring immigrant entrepreneurs. And that, um, that was a turning moment for myself, like seeing my dad's face, seeing how, you know, that mistake could have been avoided and seeing the, the hole in the market. And again, this is two years ago, they're starting to be like this amazing program, the weekend program. Um, there are now more programs helping newcomers uh, open up businesses, but two years ago, there was nothing. And I started to get on stages. I started to talk, I started to lobby the government about how uh, we need more help for immigrants to, that want to open up businesses, how we need more programs. And, uh, and, and I started sharing my own experience and my dad's experience and my mom's experience to kind of kind of portray what really is happening and I've been um, uh, so fortunate that ever since that moment I've been able to help a lot of newcomers and it's probably one of the most rewarding parts of my day really so I still have my businesses I have my staff and I love my businesses but I know that we're not supposed to play favorites when you're a mom with your kids, but this one is my favorite business because this is where I actually see um, a legacy. This is where I actually can tell that I am making a difference in this world and I'm actually helping other people change their lives. So for example, Roxana, she actually ended up working for me at the restaurant, magnificent cook, by the way. She's from El Salvador. And then when we, when I was training her in, in, in the job, she said, hey, Carla, all I've ever wanted to do is open up my own restaurant. And I'm like, so why don't you? And she's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, okay. So I started training her not just how to run, not, not just how to like build stuff on my restaurant, but how to run my restaurant because I knew that that knowledge would actually help her run her own restaurant. So I started helping her building her business plan. I started uh, putting her in touch with my own networks of like lenders and uh, so on and so forth. And eventually she ended up opening her own restaurant, which I'm super excited about. And uh, and she she's like the best pupusa maker of the world. If you don't know what a pupusa is, you've missed out on life. Anyways, it's a it's a great Salvadorian like I don't I it's, I don't even know how to describe it. it's just it's 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 a dream it's just, it's a dream in your mouth so uh, Google it and see if there's any people that sell pupusas wherever you're in um, and like her uh, you know it's been two years that I've held a whole bunch of businesses so Exo Gourmet a lady from Nigeria Kinzia a guy from uh, Jerusalem uh, Anna Steinberg a lady from Colombia Jogo Juice another Nigerian runners on fire uh, from Mexico and many 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 more people and again this is the, the, the part that I love most about my life is uh, is the ability to to help other people do um, do business because I, I live and breathe business. So, um, and it's been so rewarding. And, and again, I, I'm sort of like the squeaky wheel that, that always talks and advocates for immigrant entrepreneurship. And after two years of doing it nonstop, obviously people start catching up. And uh, my local uh, or Ottawa's local small business enterprise center, so Invest Ottawa, 
call one day and said, hey, we need to increase diversity and entrepreneurship here in Ottawa and we see what you're doing. And I became one of their business advisors, which I still do to this date. So I advise local businesses, regardless if they're immigrants or not. Um, but I advise them and I help them scale. Uh, I help them open, like people come to me with ideas and then I help develop those ideas or if people have a business already, they need to scale or they need to, um, they need to pivot. Pivot is the word of the year. Um, so, and, and again, this is one of the most rewarding uh, jobs that I do have. And I, I, I love the saying too, because this is so true. Some people, um, you know, like those music genius, they, they, they see the world through musical notes and sounds. And then the, the, the artists, they see the world through colors and, and the rainbow and the math whizzes, which I admire. They see, they see the world through numbers. I see the world through business. So I open and close a thousand business a day. Um, and then I, I just, I, it just my, I, I really wholeheartedly love creating something out of nothing and empowering others to do the same. Um, so yeah, so the, the work that I do with Invest Ottawa is extremely rewarding. And um, a couple of years, so no, uh, one year ago, a couple of years ago, um, the city of Ottawa has a really cool recognition where they, uh, it's an awards, but they, where they recognize immigrant entrepreneurs that have made a difference in the local economy. And I was named one of them along with all of these fine individuals from all over the world that have decided to make Ottawa their home. And uh, Mayor Jim Watson, who's like smack there in the middle with the poppy, um, he, he's, he's made it in his plan to actually recognize the contributions of immigrants in the local economy, which I applaud and I would encourage any, any city officials to do the same across Canada because truly um, uh, entrepreneurship and immigrant entrepreneurship is on the rise and we do uh, provide jobs and we do make a difference in, in our local economy. And, uh, and it's just so inspiring to be, to be you know, rubbing elbows with, with these amazing people. Now, speaking about immigrant uh, entrepreneurship, here's the good. Okay, so immigrant entrepreneurs, uh, we're growing at twice the, the rate that those that are not. One quarter, so 25% of all business owners currently in Canada are immigrants, which is amazing. And I, this uh, is actually from Statistics Canada, that businesses created by newcomers have a higher success rate than those created by Canadian born entrepreneurs. It's by a one or two percentage point, but still it's really good. And um, BDC, which is the bank for entrepreneurs here in Canada, business development um, corporation, is it corporation? Yes. Um, they uh, did a, um, a report that they launched last year. So the findings they launched them last year, but it's from 2018. And they found that 40% in 2018, 40% of Canadian businesses were started by newcomers. 40%. So almost half of all businesses in Canada were started by newcomers. And um, obviously the total number of immigrant business owners is 20, 22% higher. Um, done in 2006. I mean, it's a it's a huge age gap there, or a time gap there, but still. So all this to say that um, if you are an immigrant, um, we're trending, which is cool in business. Uh, we just know we just need to know how to do it properly, so that we don't end up with a similar situation like my dad ended up being in. So as an immigrant myself, uh, let me just go to the next one. Are there any questions? Actually, let me just check the, so I haven't, I, I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat. Does anybody have one that they'd like to drop into the chat to ask? Oh, Carrie, you grew up in Gloucester? Yes, and that's where we took our dog oh, to the what? Montreal. Yes, as soon as that we said so Montreal Road, I was like, oh my goodness, that's that our pet. So, that's my papa, that's so cool. Yes. I lived there for 24 years. It's so crazy. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> crazy. Small world. Any wow. questions that anyone has? Or I, I know people are just definitely putting some positive comments in there. Go ahead. If you have questions, we'll come back to you folks, uh, but we'll let Carla continue for now then. Yeah. So some of the key learnings from myself as an entrepreneur and from other entrepreneurs that I, um, that I advise is um, there's a saying that is like, you know, like when the people go to like hunting or whatever, it's usually uh, 
what is it? Is it aim ready fire or ready aim fire? So you're, you're basically getting ready first. No, it's aim and then you're ready and then you fire. Not that I'm, that I'm encouraging hunting, but just like, just the saying. And what happens, unfortunately, um, I don't want to generalize, but I am going to a little bit because I am sure a lot of you um, that are newcomers will probably uh, identify with this. We, we grew up in, especially if you're a, a, an, uh, an immigrant from a developing country, we grew up being very self-sufficient. We grew up not really trusting our governments. We grew up really not like basically being very self-reliant and creating our own uh, financial wealth, whether it is by selling food from your home or selling cakes or you, I remember in Mexico, everybody was selling me something and I was doing the same thing. But we don't really put a lot of thought behind that. We just, you know, we just, well, we just got up and do it, right? And um, some of the key learnings that I found here in Canada is that that fire ready aim mentality where you start doing before you really think about it and before you really kind of you know add one and two together can be detrimental in the long term it can be very exciting to start a business right away without even thinking about it and then just going with the flow but unfortunately and and that's the way that we were probably used to doing in our country but unfortunately that's not a great foundation to build a business that could scale or to build a business that will be a long-term um, a long-term business uh, for you. So obviously my key key learning, if you, if you can walk away here with anything is um, there is something that I, whether you are asking for a loan, asking or anything, whether you're opening a side gig, a seasonal business, a little online shop, anything, work on your business model canvas. Um, that will be your secret weapon, number one, um, but that will definitely be your, your secret weapon. And um, I have, I don't know if I can send, I'll send the slides to Carrie and then Carrie, you can share them. But basically what the business canvas is going to be, is going to do is just a one sheet, one sheet paper that is going to ask you all of these amazing questions that are going to make you like slow down a little bit on your excitement with the business and actually put some meat into it on what are you going to sell? Um, you know, how much you're going to sell it, how are you going to sell it? And then, um, you know, how are you going to target those customers? So a lot of the times we get so excited in starting the business that those questions, we don't even think about it. And we're like, I'll figure it out on the go. Uh, if you want to build a sustainable business and a business that is going to grow, then um, at the very, 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 very least, I truly, truly encourage you to do a business model canvas. Super easy to do. Um, easy to do, but it'll probably take you a few days to complete because it will actually force you to answer some questions that you probably haven't thought about. Um, there's um, there's some templates that you can that you can download on the internet. There's uh, Canvanizer. YouTube has a whole bunch of tutorials. Pinterest has tutorials. Just Google it. Um, and then another um, uh, another tip is just you know the local economic development agencies or your libraries may have business model canvas tutorials that are available for free. Uh, I'm sure we can have some some sort of education programming available. Um, uh, but anyway, so reach out. It doesn't matter how size what size your business is. Try doing a, a business model canvas, even if your your business is open already uh, and you haven't done it. It's totally cool. Uh, try doing it and then see how that business model is actually going to challenge you to grow bigger and, and get better at business. Now, for those people that are looking to actually get a loan, um, if you want to get a loan through a bank or any any repayable loan, um, this was news to to us as as you know as Canadians. Uh, oh, sorry, as, as Mexicans or as immigrants, is that if you go to the bank, they're always, always, always going to ask for a business plan. And a business plan is a more robust uh, document than the business model canvas. Um, so they just want to make sure that, that you've done your research, that you've worked on your numbers, and there's two really cool templates. Um, so BDC has a template. 
futurepreneur is my favorite, um, just because it's uh, it starts asking you questions and the answers start. It actually goes into a builder where it, it starts building your PDF file that turns into your uh, into your template. So they're free tools. They're available. Another hot tip, hot is, and I don't know if Kingston has this, I'm assuming they, they could, they should, but some of the main um, Ottawa, or some of the main public libraries actually have business librarians. I know this happens in Ottawa, but I would, um, I would suggest you contact your main main, like the main central library, wherever you live and ask if they have the business services. So what ends up happening is that, for example, here in Ottawa, you book an appointment and you show them what you need to add into your business plan, like what type of market research you need to do. Libraries have access to databases that would be prohibitive for us to subscribe to. So they have access to all of this data that uh, normally we can't afford. And what you end up doing is you meet with this library and business library and you tell them what type of market research you need and the questions you need answered. And then they go back into their little databases stuff, whatever, and they find that information for you and then they send it to you via email. And so long as you have a library card, it's a free, it's a free, um, it's a free service. So again, I know this exists in Ottawa, but I wouldn't be surprised if the main, main, main public libraries in the area that you live would have something similar, particularly if you live in a, in a bigger city like Kingston or Toronto, I'm sure they would have something like that. Um, let me see. Okay, some other cool, uh, useful little tips. Uh, I know we've, I, I know you probably are sick and tired of people telling you that you have to network, uh, particularly as an immigrant that is such a, you know, it's sort of like one of the things that they tell you right from the get go that you need to network. But um, what I encourage you is to network in business like communities online and offline. So basically what you are doing right now, coming to these type of, of, uh, of events, um, use it as a networking opportunity. So we have the chat here, see who's on, try to connect with them on LinkedIn. Um, meetup.com, for those that don't know, meetup.com is an online way to, actually it's an online way to connect in person pre-COVID um, on with people that are uh, lovers of whatever topic. And there are meetups, meetup groups for people that love business and meetup groups that love, you know, food and so on and so forth. So there's actually really cool. Uh, it's a really cool way to connect with others. And the amazing thing that COVID, COVID has brought is this, right, that all of a sudden you have access to networks. Uh, because everything is online that you would have never imagined. So highly encourage you to connect uh, with other groups of, of like-minded business people. Um, just a quick story. So again, so I'm I'm sort of the, 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 the crazy one in my family that has like all of these crazy ideas on a minute by minute basis on businesses. And my family and my friends, they kind of roll their eyes at me like, oh my God, here you go with another business idea. So I can guarantee that there is someone in here that feels the same, that their family doesn't understand them, their family that why don't you just get a job, just get a job, just, you know, just, just something safe. But you have this thing inside of you that you're like, no, I want to have my own business. So that's why I encourage you to connect with business like communities, because we love connecting with people that have ideas. We love encouraging others. We love sharing our contacts. We love sharing. We love hearing about people that have ideas and want to make it into a business. Um, the, the entrepreneurship community in Canada as a whole is super welcoming. So that's why I always encourage you to, yeah, you know, hang out with your, with your cultural groups and your family and friends. But if you feel like you're like the black sheep of your family, that nobody understands you try to look for those groups in business, uh, in other business communities. Um, Again, I mentioned uh, there's courses in different local economic development agencies or business small small business enterprise centers. One tip: if you anywhere you are, anywhere where you are, just Google small business enterprise center and then the town where you're in, and it's basically going to give you the 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 local center that encourages entrepreneurship. Not all of the cities have it though, but just check it out and see if your city has it. 
and try to see what they offer in terms of courses. And it's not just for people wanting to start a business. If you already have a business, these centers have a business advisory, like the advisory that I do at Invest Ottawa. They have events, they have a whole bunch of uh, programming that helps encourage entrepreneurship. And the best of everything is that it's a free, um, it's a free service. So you might as well, as well take advantage of it. Um, I, I mentioned a few ones. So if you're in Alberta, Business Link in Alberta, Enterprise Toronto, if you're in Toronto, Invest Ottawa. Carrie, what's the name of the one in Kingston? So we have the Kingston Economic Development Corporation is probably one of the uh, biggest. Um, and then at Queens, which we're through, we have Startup Runway and We Can. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. So anyways, they're free. So I'll take advantage of that. And then reaching out, oh my goodness, reaching out, like keep dreaming and working and planning towards it. Uh, I know, like don't give up. Remember, if you're an immigrant, remember that Canada needs immigrants, um, but it's also a big opportunity for us to give back to the country that has embraced us by creating jobs, by creating, you know, encouraging the local economy and contributing to the lo local economy. There's so much we can do as immigrant um, entrepreneurs and uh, and just keep, keep dreaming and keep reaching out and don't give up. I know sometimes uh, times are hard, particularly right now, um, but a lot of the best businesses have come out from, um, from a recession. So keep dreaming and keep reaching out. Um, some key learnings, just quickly, um, your voice matters. I know that sometimes when we are immigrants, and again, I'm gonna be focusing on the, on, on the immigrant side, but it can be anybody. Sometimes we are very self-conscious about our accent. Sometimes we're very self-conscious about, well, I'm new here, I don't know anybody, but your voice, your story, your knowledge matters. And the more you talk about it, whether it is on social media, whether it is with your friends, whether it is with colleagues, whether it is in, in places like this or in opportunities like this, you never know who you are going to inspire because I can guarantee that your story has some wisdom that is probably gonna benefit somebody else if you allow yourself to share it. If it's a story or if it's something that you, you know, if it's if it's a business that you want to open and you're having you're having struggles, share them. Share those struggles because again, you never know who is gonna be, you know, raising their hand and saying, I'm I can help you. You know, I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Um, so I know it can be kind of petrifying to raise your voice at the beginning and that little the, the, the little nagging voice in the back of your head is probably going to be telling you like nasty little things. Don't listen to that voice. Your voice matters. And, and, and again, by sharing your voice, sharing your stories and your ideas, you're going to inspire yourself, but I can 100% guarantee that you are going to inspire somebody else. So share your voice because it matters. Another, um, another tip is be part of something bigger than you or your business. Um, and I know that this saying that we are stronger together, again, that's another saying for the year 2020 because of COVID. Let me tell you, it is true. We are stronger together. So COVID for myself has been a huge um, humility checker <laughs> because as entrepreneurs, and sometimes as immigrants too, we're so used to being self-sufficient and self-reliant that we tend to just like focus on our own stuff, focus on our own business, focus on anything. And we don't really look out and see, you know, what, what is out there that I can be part of. Usually like, nope, I'm so busy just trying to make it with my own business or with my own family or with my own experience or whatever you are going through that sometimes we forget to look up. Um, and and when COVID hit, for example, obviously the restaurant industry has been hit terribly. My restaurant is not excluded from that. I decided to reach out. <laughs> I, I decided to be part of something bigger because being an entrepreneur can also be a very lonely experience. Um, it, is, it is very lonely because you're so focused in your business that you forget that there is um, stuff out there. So I actually forced myself to be part of something bigger. I forced myself to get involved in the local board of trade, like the Chamber of Commerce, um, just by volunteering and, and, and attending meetings and trying to give, like helping them brainstorm how to help local businesses. 
I did it selfishly too, because I know that that those ideas would help me as well. And then it, it was so cool because I got to network and I got to meet other business owners that hadn't been for this situation. And this me wanting to be part of something bigger than me or bigger than my business, I had, I probably would have never met them. And, uh, and, and it feels good to know that you are not alone. <laughs> it, it, it honestly does. Um, and again, we're being tested left, right, and center right now because of COVID um, as, an, as an entrepreneur and as a human being, oh, like as a, just as an individual, we're, we're tested that it, it, um, it's very important to look up and, and reach your hand out and try to be part of something bigger because Honestly, I mean, it sounds cliche, but we definitely are stronger together. Um, another, another learning, and again, this is this is sort of the the mantra that I kind of I, I, I've I've done throughout my business career that doing good is good for business. Don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist. I love revenue. I love profit. I love sales. I love to build a business that is gonna sustain me and my family. But at the same time, I like to build something that is not just going to benefit me, but somehow I can use that business to help my local community. Um, so, so anytime I build a business or I challenge one of my clients when they're building their business is how can you profit, but then still support your community somehow. And I'm not saying give away your work for free or anything, but how, what can you do with your business that will allow you to, to get involved in the community and give back to that community that is supporting your business. Case in point, again, through COVID and the restaurant, I, um, there was a point where, where I was so um, feeling hopeless and feeling like, oh my God, my sales went down overnight by 80%. And my brother works in the Heart Institute, so it's like a, in a hospital here in Ottawa as a technician and through like the height of the, of, of the pandemic in back in April, May, he was telling me, oh my God, like it's, it's so, it's so busy and I'm hungry and I haven't eaten and don't tell a Latina person that somebody's hungry because we're going to feed everybody. So then, so then that's what happened. I'm like, oh my God, are you hungry? Are your friends hungry? So then I started actually I'm like, hey, well, this is an opportunity. And then I had I had clients saying, how can we help you? We feel so bad for you guys. Like, um, how can how can we help you survive this this pandemic? And I'm like, wait a minute. Here's how you guys can help. You guys can donate ten bucks, um, donate or like buy a healthcare worker a meal with its ten bucks. You're gonna be helping me as a business. I mean, I'm I am going to stay afloat because of your donation. But then in in return, I'm gonna help feed healthcare workers from like four different hospitals in Ottawa. So, in the end, um, it was it was great for business because we had the local community that were approaching us on how we can how they could help us. And then I had, you know, like hungry personnel from different hospitals telling us that they didn't even have time to eat. So we put one and two together and it was an amazing campaign. That was a highlight of COVID for me. It was like arriving with my truck full of burritos and wraps and, and then handing them out like Santa Claus. Um, and we ended up feeding um, like my local community and I, we ended up feeding about 3000 different healthcare workers. And it was so cool. And now obviously the residual karma <laughs> that, that happens after doing something good for your community is huge because I know that, um, you know, like some people were saying, you know, when, when the restrictions are lifted, I, I didn't even know your restaurant existed, but I am going to be a, a client of yours because, you know, what you've done in the community. So again, I encourage you that whatever business you are trying to build, um, just, just remember that doing good is good for business. And again, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean giving away your work. It's just finding a way that your work can actually help your local community that will support you. It's, it's a, it's just good karma all around. And um, for my immigrant friends watching, remember, actually anybody, but, but this is going to resonate to, uh, with you guys. The qualities needed, uh, the, the qualities entrepreneurs need to succeed in business are exactly the same qualities 
we as immigrants already have, right? As an entrepreneur, you need to be a risk taker. Immigrants, we've already taken the biggest risk of our lives, which is go, like uprooting ourselves from one country to another. As an entrepreneur, you need to be adaptable. That's, we, you know, as immigrants, we have to adapt. We need to be flexible as entrepreneurs. The same thing goes for immigrants. I mean, we, we have to be flexible with, <laughs> with the weather. Oh my God, adaptability and flexibility, you know? Um, resilience, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, resilience is key. As immigrants, we, we have no choice but to be resilient. Uh, there needs to be relentless in, in wanting, to, wanting to make things work uh, as an entrepreneur and not giving up. And as immigrants, we are already relentless. And humility, humility is the one that I'm trying to work more on because as immigrants, we can be a little bit proud because again, we're, <clears throat> we're used to being very self-sufficient and very self-sustainable that sometimes... Um, and depending on where, which part of the world you're from, I know that Latino culture is a very proud culture. Um, so learning how to be humble enough to say, I need help or I can't do it alone um, without asking for free passes or asking for handouts, just like real humility, like the real humility where I don't know what I don't know, but I'm willing to learn if you teach me or I don't know, you know how to, tap into this market, but I'm willing to learn if you just just show me the way and then I'll, I'll go for it. So that humility is super important in entrepreneurship and business, but it's a humility that um, I've known many immigrants to be really good at and is one that I'm really trying hard to be good at. So um, yeah, so for anybody that has thought about, you know, making a change in your life or opening a business or scaling your business, or asking for help or, you know, growing um, professionally or personal, I just, I just have one question and it is, so why don't you? And again, these are, these are the little words that my parents told me that completely changed my life. And, um, and I'm just hoping that they're going to resonate with, with some of you. So again, like I try to live by this, this, uh, this, this saying, when you become a leader, success is all about growing others. I get it, you, 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 we all are trying to grow our own lives, our own professions and our own uh, businesses or our own networks. But, but when you truly, truly become a leader is when you um, humbly share that with others to help them grow because again, we are stronger together and it is our responsibility to, um, to make the path for the next generation, the next generation of professionals, the next generation of business owners, immigrant entrepreneurs, whatever generation, um, you know, make it a habit to, to share what you know and, and, and just share it um, generously. And with that, uh, anybody who is interested in um, entrepreneurship in general, I do have a website with a whole bunch of free resources. Again, it's like the stuff that I wish somebody would have told me or my dad. So there's blog posts, there's uh, events and workshops that I do, a whole bunch of free stuff. And then um, this one I'm really excited about. I'll be launching the Immigrants Developing Entrepreneurs Academy in January, which is helping immigrants uh, go from idea to business. Uh, and it's online um, just because of COVID, obviously. Uh, I miss people. Does anybody miss people? <laughs> I miss human interaction, but anyway, so I have to adapt. And uh, and yeah, so the so launching this, the first cohort starts January 25th, and there's more information. But uh, and then I also have developed a little checklist. Uh, if you are new to Canada or you haven't arrived to Canada yet, but the idea to start a business is something that you may have. This is probably a good checklist um to um to look at it's very it's very top level but at least it gives you some sort of blueprint on the steps or the things that you need to do um, before you open the business so instead of going fire ready aim this is sort of like the the ready aim fire I can't always say anyways <laughs> And uh, connect with me. I love hearing from people. Um, I'm in all the social media. 
uh, email, LinkedIn, doesn't matter, connect with me. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to, to connect with other people. Did I tell you how much I miss people? Um, <laughs> But, uh, but really do, really do connect with me because you never know who I may know that I can connect you with um, and, uh, or within my own network and, or just connect to say hi. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. And we do have time, folks. That's the good news. We definitely left some time for you to ask your questions. And as Carla has already said, don't be shy to use your voice. This is a great moment Again, this whole session is not just about learning, it's about Sorry. building your network. So now Carla is in your network. I mean, congratulations, what a rock star, obviously. Um, and I'm so excited also to have her in my network and uh, this, this is how it works. And so if there are any questions that you have, um, just you can drop it in the chat and we can, you can ask it live as well. So does anyone have a question? that has come up during, or you can even just, you know, you can have a comment. I've seen lots of comments in the chat. So uh, if you, uh, if you want to go ahead, I'll try to uh, navigate and facilitate the discussion. Who would like to go first? I've seen lots of notes in the chat. I do, while you're thinking, I do have one question and you already answered one of my questions, but um, I, I was wondering, cause you mentioned you have brothers. So I was wondering if you, the rest of the siblings in your family went on to become entrepreneurs. You mentioned one was a heart tech. Um, um, yeah, so they do in their own, um, in their own way. So they, they have, um, both of them have jobs. Actually, no, one of them is unemployed right now because of COVID cause he's in the aerospace engineering, you know, Field. So obviously that's an industry that is that is uh, struggling quite a bit right now, but um, but he ended up saving and saving and saving and then bought a, a little uh, triplex a building. So he's he's a landlord uh, and he loves that. So it's like a little um, residual income that he has. And then the, my brother that works in the Heart Institute, he is an avid fisherman. He loves fishing to the point that now he's made it his side gig. So he um, created, uh, created a little tour company um, and he just takes people fishing in the different spots and he has his license and everything. So, but they have their own full-time jobs, but always entrepreneurship is something that's always been in our family, whether it is on the side or full-time. Um, yeah, and that's that's the beauty of entrepreneurship is that a lot of people think that entrepreneurship and having a business should be a full time endeavor, and it doesn't doesn't have to, right? Um, so so long as you're passionate about what you're doing, you can do it on the side, you can do it seasonally, um, or you can do it full time. Brilliant. All right. Any questions now that you had a moment? And Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth Lopez is on the line. Elizabeth, I was wondering if you could just, if there's no questions, uh, I'll wait though. Is there a question? We've got a shy group here today. I know, so shy. Don't be shy. Just speak up and make a comment if nothing else. But Elizabeth Lopez, you're on the line. Um, I know, are you, are you able to chat or are you doing something else, Elizabeth? I was wondering if you could just mention about the Hire Yourself program as well. Hello. Hello, Hi. everyone. Uh, thank you, Carla. It's been great hearing your story and so inspiring. And um, yes, I am part of KEYS, as I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, the Your Way program. Uh, Hire Yourself is a program from EGDEF, which would also be very good for you in the case that you want to uh, get into the road of entrepreneurship. Um, well, Hire Yourself is a program that will help you to create your idea and evaluate what you want to do with your business. And in the case of your way, it's like the next step. Uh, we will see with our participants, you will be able to learn all about the business model canvas. You will be working with a future printer, as Carla mentioned. And it is a three month uh, program, uh, which I will be glad to share with you in the case that you're interested, I will leave out my email and we can have a short meeting and I can explain to you more about the program. Thank you, Carrie, for this opportunity. Yes, of course, and I, Elizabeth, while you were speaking, I just put in, and sorry, yeah, I, 
Elizabeth is actually the head of Your Way. We also have a Hire Yourself program within the Weekend program for newcomers to Canada. I just put a couple of links there as well. And Carla has also suggested an excellent one, which obviously kicks off uh, very soon as well. It is ex ex extremely uh, encouraging, I think, that there has been more uh, focus placed in this area because, I, see, I mean, those numbers are amazing. 40% of the new businesses being started are, are by immigrants. And sometimes that's out of necessity, but I, I think that also the opportunity is there. And you, um, I was just speaking with an immigrant earlier, actually yesterday, uh, a, new, a new weekend client who um, is an immigrant. And she was talking about instead of this up and down flow, which the economy has done, Everyone's talking about it now in terms of the letter K, right? Where we have some businesses taking off straight into the stratosphere. I think of your pet business, Carla, because everyone has been adopting pets and buying pet supplies yep. and such. <laughs> and then we have the ones that are going straight down. If you think about the letter K um, and the restaurants, you know, so you're kind of on both sides I'm of the both. K. <laughs> you're going both ways at once. <laughs> it is, it's, a, it's oh. an emotional roller coaster every day. Oh, it is, wow. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. All right, so, oh, um, I have a question here, Carla, that I'll read to you. You might see it there as well. In your opinion, what are some ways or mindset shifts that newcomers need to, to do to sell products or services beyond their cultural community? Really great question. That's a great question. So in terms of mindset, um, just understand that your product has a place outside of your cultural community. And, uh, and again, that's, it's a mindset. So it is a mindset, but it's also some research, right? Like it takes a little bit of research to talk to other people that would be your ideal clients that are not part of your cultural community. And then just talking about them and see and testing the product or the service and asking them for their feedback. Uh, so it's, uh, that's called like beta testing. So beta testing your product outside of your cultural community, getting feedback, ad adapting it, because it's not going to look exactly the same or it's not going to taste exactly the same if you want it for like the wider, you know, outside of your cultural, uh, cultural group. But I think that the mindset shift that needs to happen is that your product has a place outside and convincing yourself and knowing that your product has a place outside of your cultural community. And sometimes, sometimes it's like, it's a, it's a self um, impediment that, that we believe that, well, no, nobody's going to like this because they're not used to X, Y, or Z. So that's why I encourage to a, you know, start believing that it does have a place, but then start beta testing it with a friendly audience of uh, people outside of your cultural community and then take their feedback and, and, and adjust accordingly. That's a great point. And I, I hear that all the time when we have, uh, I mean, today it's really focused on newcomers to Canada and immigrant women. However, I know there are probably others on the line, but our general weekend sessions are such an intersection of individuals. Some are immigrants, some are uh, indigenous women, some are from the tech industry. And so that then, and to Carla's point that when you're a part of a bigger community where you're sharing those ideas, sometimes you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one who's terrified or of sharing this idea or, you know, it's common. And there was a couple other people that put in the, the comments. I think it was Lanny who just said, I'm a first generation entrepreneur. I'm not a newcomer, but I feel that same way. So there is a boldness that comes, I think, that we can give each other, mm -hmm. especially as women, perhaps, um, who maybe we come from backgrounds where that wasn't encouraged. And so just something to think about is that, like Carla said, being a part of a community and showing up on a regular basis can just give you that fuel you need, I think, to take it to the next level. And, and Carla, you fueled us up today. I don't know. I don't think I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's that, um, uh, you know, and sometimes it's fear. It's fear being judged or fear of um, not being good enough or fear. Or, and then you start comparing yourself like this little I'm going to, I'm going to swear a little bit, but I call it the itty bitty shitty committee, you know, like the little, the little, the itty bitty voice in, in the back of your head that tells you that you can't do it. Who, who do you think you are? What, what do you think, you know, I, you can't do this. And it's that, that little self voice that, that um, sometimes even acknowledging that you have that voice 
can can be enough to shut it off like you know like somebody said or somebody mentioned like i'm not an immigrant and it's still hard for me the 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 mindset shift that happens when you actually acknowledge that and share it it's it's huge it's huge because then you give yourself permission to say okay this is tough but then you're sharing it to other people that are understanding and that that know where you're coming from but that can also say, you know, can also reach out to you and say, hey, do you need help? I can I can help you out. Or you give them permission to to speak their mind. And then there's something cool that happens, something beautiful that happens when you just acknowledge the blockage that you have or, or the issue that you have. And then all of a sudden it doesn't feel as paralyzing or as big. So true. Sophia, I see you on the line. Did you want to make a comment? So nice to see you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Carla. Hola, Carla. Hola. I'm from Mexico, and I'm part for the weekend program and Women Doing Our Way for Kids. I'm the first generation. And yeah, it's, you, you have all the right. It's coming in a new country, learn the new uh, how to live, how to live in seasons, how interaction with another people, it's a big challenge. Mm-hmm. But you have right, we can do it this is a step by the step. We commit some mistakes, but that's the fun to we learning. Mm -hmm. you know? And yep. And thank you so much. This webinar, it's amazing, inspire me a lot. And you have right and other things to do. Sometimes we have that uh, words in our hand. No, you don't do that. You're going to commit mistakes, but we can do this. Of course, of course you can. And I mean, having this supportive group here. It's huge. Take advantage of it. Like, yeah. honestly, oh my God. Yeah. By my way, my business is a small farm and I hope I can bring more people for our country or another people to come work. Oh, and, farm workers. Yep. Yeah, that's amazing. What yeah. kind of, uh, what do you grow in the farm? Vegetables. It's the first year's, well, the last uh, crop. And that's my second year. I be learning a lot because it's not the same farming in Mexico <laughs> to here in Canada. It's uh, the weather, the kind of the soil, uh, the seeds, uh, how to run up before the, the time correct. And I'm learning a lot. I am so proud of you. Que orgullo. Wow. Amazing. Gracias. <laughs> And Sophia, you said you're part of your way, right? That's the program you're in right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. It's uh, the first generation. We are, uh, well, there are two groups and Elizabeth, she's uh, our head <laughs> and our helper a lot. Uh, there are one group, uh, we did the culinary with St. Lawrence College. They teach you or with Cherry and Emma and all our respect of the techniques for the culinary, how to make your menu um, and the health regulations and another things. And another it's for the area with Rebecca um, Darling. She's teach you uh, everything about of administration and we have uh, some uh, invitation people to come to talk to us. And we are now learning how to, the first step was the business model canvas. Now we are learning with the business uh, uh, um, program and we are working all that. And we have a small uh, Facebook page to his woman doing our way. And we are help us to us because some they are uh, very good in the computer and other they are not too well for the computer. And that's what we are doing now, helping one with another. Amazing. Good for you. You're going to be delivering one of these workshops like Carla one day. So yeah. yeah, I believe yeah. that. <laughs> You're going to have a fancy bat. Don't you love her background? I said she looks like she's on the Today Show or something. Yeah. I, I love to do one in the farm and go in the field and teach how it's for you. Feel oh, the, awesome. the, the air and, and, and teach the new generation. My daughter is helped me a lot. Mia, she has seven years old. That's where we have the name for her. Tierra Mia Family mm -hmm. Farm. Love it. And I see how she's love it to be and, and, and put the seeds and be in contact with the natural things around to us and, and the beers <laughs> and some raccoons. <laughs> but yeah, I love Amazing. to see her run up over there and more children doing this and, and new, new generations to be inspired for that. Incredible, well done, Sophia. I, I, I just can't wait to see what it becomes and I, I love to see it as it's becoming, it's incredible. Yeah. 
Um, any questions for Carla before we sign up for the day? Does anybody else want to give a comment or a question? This is your time. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for you, Carla, and Kiri for this session. I'm just I'm Khadija, and I had just come in Canada three months hmm. as a permanent resident. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to set up my project, but uh, really, I don't know what type of project will be good for me. Oh, you just have to angle your microphone a little bit better. I heard that you are deciding on a product, correct? What? What we heard was you're thinking about starting a product, and then we lost you. <laughs> no, I want to set up my project, but I don't know what type of that will be good here in Canada for uh, for me. I which can uh, service all the different communities. Just to have a large market. Don't uh, focus in my community. You understand my my question? Okay, so you're looking at what type of a product to choose for the Canadian market. Something where there would be a large enough market. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Don't speak, don't if I in one community. Uh, okay. I want, uh, I want to set up a project uh, which will be good here in Canada. Because at that time, I don't know very good the class and the uh, and, uh, different community what they need. Okay, I'm just losing you technologically, but Carla can start to answer that. And if you want to type some more details into the chat, maybe we can read them. We're losing you um, the audio. But Carla, do you, uh, uh, if you're starting market research for a new country, how would you start that? The market research? Um, so I would recommend, I mean, Google, I mean, we have the, the internet at our fingertips. But yes, yes. That's yeah. Experience here. And then I would also start uh, looking into a Statistics Canada, depending on what the product is. Uh, what industry the product is in, I would look into some, like if there's any research on Statistic Canada about that particular industry or product. I'm not, I'm not sure what you are thinking of doing. Um, there's, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of information out there on Google, but trying to see if there is a product market fit in the Canadian market. Um, so Statistic Canada is a really good one. Again, I'm not sure what the industry is um, that, that you are looking into. Um, trying to find out also, um, oh, I'm gonna get very technical here. So Statistics Canada has a part, has a website that is called Industry Benchmarks. And then in that part of Statistics Canada, you can look profitability the, of divided by industry. So you can actually see real numbers because they they basically um, they basically taken um, businesses of the of of a specific industry together and they've looked at their profitability like real time profitability and then they can tell you what the benchmarks of profitability are so if, uh, so let's say and they can go as niche uh, so let's say you want to open something in the say food industry then you can look, okay, so within the food industry, we have food products, grocery products, we have restaurants, we have uh, farms, so on and so forth. And then you can go inside of each one and see what are the real numbers from Canadian markets or from the Canadian market of profitability. And I find that research that you can do if you're not in Canada yet, that would be a great research to start with because then, then it gives you real numbers right it gives you real numbers if this is an industry or um, an industry that is uh, historically profitable in Canada and if you're looking for a certain region like Carla mentioned already there's a small business enterprise center in pretty much every city uh, in Canada so whether you're here already or you're looking to move you can reach out to me if you like um, my email I'll put again into the chat and I can help you find the one that's in your region but for instance, in Kingston, they would have a good breakdown of the local, you know, industries. My dog just walked in. Do you see that? <laughs> of, of local industries, and perhaps can give you more regional statistics. So, sorry about that. Technic. Oh, there she is. Can you? Can we hear you? 
Many thanks for you. Many thanks. Good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just reach out and we're, we'll be happy to, uh, to follow up. All right, so thank you to everyone for joining us today. And Carla, especially, what, a, what an inspiration on a Tuesday morning. And so I know that we're all fueled up and ready to get back into our businesses and work some more. Thank you so much on behalf of everyone. Again, I'm going to put my email into the chat one more time for anybody who would like a copy of today's recording. And if you would, then by all means, I just spelled that wrong. There we go. Uh, reach out to me and I'm happy to either find your local business enterprise center or um, uh, connect you with Carla, uh, get you the slides, or uh, today's recording, whatever you're in need of. So thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you guys.